Khan, whose lecture today is entitled The Possibilities and Limits of Decolonizing Anthropology, Ethics, Methods, and Blind Spots. This event has, has brought to, is brought to you by the Nanavik Institute for European Studies. My name is Abby Lewis, and I serve as the Director of Undergraduate Studies at, at this institute, as well as a postdoctoral researcher. And one of the projects that fortunately fell into my lap last year was the Decolonizing Scholarship Speaker Series. The Nanavik Institute for European Studies, founded 30 years ago, has a strategic plan that invites us to think about peripheries as well as European studies and the big questions around Europe today. And for us, this includes the le uh, legacies of colonialism and dynamics of peripheralization. Um, and last semester, we launched this series with a commitment to decenter the center in European studies and to listen to voices that are typically underrepresented in our understandings of the past and present. Um, we will continue this series during the 2023-24 academic year, where we will look at this question from different angles and disciplinary perspectives. So what does it mean to decolonize philosophy, theology, cultural studies, anthropology, political science? Decolonizing is an intentional effort to rethink thinking, to unlearn learning, and to create new practices. And we'll, we will hopefully have some deep conversations that will then inform our practices. Um, just looking ahead, next month on Wednesday, so remember it's a Wednesday, not a Friday, uh, November 15th, Rufus Burnett will give a lecture entitled Blue Notes on Flesh, Regenerating Intimacy in a Racialized World. Next semester, we will also welcome Liddy Mutolino. Uh, we will be rescheduling her talk, um, who will give a lecture entitled Poaching French Theory. Um, and Hannah Feldman from Northwestern will join us to talk about decolonizing art history. Um, these lectures will have to live up to a high bar set by today's event. Um, and before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to give um, a heartfelt thanks to Becca Prince, who makes all of these events happen and is so thoughtfully put together um, the itinerary. So thank you, Becca. And next, uh, I'll, I'll invite Dr. Sevda Arsalan to introduce Professor Shoshan. And Sevda is an anthropologist interested in migration and minority studies. Thank you, Sevda, for introducing us on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abby, and thank you to the Nanavik Institute for organizing this wonderful event. It's great to be here all today with you and to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Nitsan Shoshan, who's visiting us from Mexico. He's an anthropology professor in the sociology department at El Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City. He completed his undergraduate studies at Harvard College, graduating magna cum laude in social sciences, and then he went to Chicago for his master's and PhD in anthropology. Do we have any anthropology students or faculty in the room? Oh, that's wonderful. Few of us are here. So his list of publica uh, publications and accomplishments is, as you can imagine, very long and vast. However, the main reason probably why I'm here is because of his prize-winning book titled um, The Management of Hate, Nation, Effect, and Right-Wing Extremism in Germany, which I really enjoyed reading as a graduate student here. So. If you're looking for great ethnography, I highly recommend his book, and most importantly, it's even available online, so you can just read it on your phone. <laughs> the book was not just interesting to me because I'm from Germany, raised by immigrant parents, but it also was very insightful and helpful as I ended up doing my dissertation field work in Berlin as well. So Professor Shoshan, as um, I've mentioned, um, um, you know, his research is rooted, as um, Abby was saying, in anthropological work and focuses on nationalism, populism, and right-wing extremism in Germany and beyond, on urban politics and governance in Berlin and Mexico City, and more recently also on political conflict in Latin America. He has a, he's a very successful scholar, has lived in very different parts of the world and published in several languages. But to keep this introduction short today, I thought I could end with three facts that you might not find, actually you cannot find on his CV. Firstly, he and his wife have two daughters, ages 12 and 16. Secondly, his first impression of Notre Dame was when he arrived here on Wednesday evening that it looked very gothic. And then <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, as you can remember, when it was pouring, he uh, found in the daylight the Notre Dame dome drive to be very impressive. I found out that he's going to have a tour later, so let's see how his impression changes. Um, and lastly, what was probably most 
striking to me is to find out that Professor Shoshan was born and raised in a kibbutz in Israel. So a kibbutz, for those who don't know, I had to look up the spelling last night. It's spelled K-I-B-B-U-T-Z. It is a community model where people voluntarily live and work um, together on a non-competitive basis. So he has personally experienced the post-social transition, which also shed some light on his um, academic work. Now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Nitsan Shoshan. Thank you all. I'm told I need to turn this on. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Is this amplification? I'm told it's been recorded. Thank you so much, Ferda, for this introduction and all the embarrassing personal details as well, which we don't usually get. Um, but uh, now, well, now I can see better. So, uh, so I, I think before I begin, I want to thank the Nanovi Institute for this uh, invitation to come here, and particularly Rebecca Prince and Abigail Lewis for organizing my visit to Notre Dame, um, as well as all of you for being here today, obviously. Um, it's truly a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to share with you some of my work, and I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to visit your university, finally. Um, so, as is my habit, I seem to have forgotten the remote here, that's also my habit, but um, as is my habit before traveling to new destinations for academic engagements, in preparation for my visit today, I tried to get a sense of who my hosts were and what audience I might expect uh, to encounter here. So I scroll down, let's see, is this, yeah. I scroll down um, through the impressive list of faculty fellows, some 170 of them listed on the website. Um, and uh, whose scholarly fields cover a very broad spectrum from various European languages and literatures, art, architecture, and philosophy, to history, music, gender studies, political science, and others. Strangely though, although to be honest, also not that strangely after all, um, of the 170 associated faculty members with such a varied set of disciplinary perspectives on Europe, I could not identify a single cultural anthropologist. Things were not much different among the graduate students, where out of 40 people in a similarly heterogeneous collection of scholarly fields, only one, Serda, um, is a cultural anthropologist of Europe. In some sense, perhaps everything that needs to be said about decolonizing anthropology is crystallized in this very minor survey, which I can assure you uh, would produce similar results elsewhere as well. I hope, however, that you will stay until the end of my talk and indulge me as I attempt to uh, unpack this palpable absence, because the story behind it is not a simple one. Colonialism shapes scholarly spaces in various ways, some linked with institutional structures and hierarchies, others operating within the norms that govern different disciplines, such as anthropology. Given that Europeanist anthropologists do exist, where are they? To be sure, to some extent, they roam European academic institutions, though by far most European, uh, as opposed to Europeanist, anthropologists still study the global south, in sharp contrast with most other academic disciplines and humanities, uh, social science and humanities. To some extent, we find a few of them in US anthropology, though here too, they are a small minority. Um, 
And I would guess that there are no more than half a dozen European anthropologists elsewhere in the world, if that. Again, this is decidedly not the case for other disciplines. Why is this so? A full answer is surely more than I can attempt here, not to mention that I'd like to focus in this talk on some of the problems, ethical and methodological, that haunted my own specific research with young neo-Nazis in Berlin, and what they might say to debates about decolonization. But before I get there, allow me to mention some issues that I think have been particularly central to anthropological talk of decolonization. Now, the position of anthropology, as is well known, uh, is arguably unique with regard to the decolon decolonizing project. On the one hand, the discipline has emerged together with as an, as an, an, and as an integral part of European imperialist agendas. It has therefore, from the start, been uh, intricately complicit with the colonization of various world regions. And this is Malinovsky uh, in the Trobian Islands and European imperialism at its height before the First World War. Um, on the other hand, and precisely because of this legacy, anthropology has embarked upon a trajectory of critical self-reflection about its colonial nature earlier than most other disciplines, I think. Although some people here might correct me, and I'd welcome that. For over half a century now, anthropological scholarship has sought to, to confront this legacy and to transform the discipline. The issues that have stood at the center of these debates will most likely come uh, as no news to anthropologists in the audience um, and may very well turn out to be quite familiar to practitioners of other academic disciplines who are present here. So I'm not, uh, um, uh, not saying necessarily anything very new uh, in, what's, in what follows. We could think of them as questions of locations, of gatekeeping, of justice, of positionality, of topics, and of methods. And let me explain briefly what I mean by each of those. So questions of location refer to the geographical placement of particular voices in, regi in the regimes of scholarly knowledge production, which reproduce colonial geographies. They configure vectors of knowledge extraction and value defining what places can research and write about, what, what places one can research and write about from specific locations. These geo-epistemological maps gain their outlines from the structures of research funding agencies, from uh, disparate institutional commitments, as well as from ideological assumptions about academic hierarchies. Such that, for example, in my case, studying Europe ethnographically from Latin America is financially daunting, frowned upon at one's institution, home institution, and met with some befuddlement in Europe. Um, while doing the opposite does not, right? And this is just a map of university, world university rankings. Uh, the darker it is, the higher the ranking. Um, and we can see what sort of geographies that, that map reproduces. Um, the second question is of, or the second set of questions are questions of gatekeeping. And they encompass the multiple checkpoints that regulate the distribution of prestige, the differential assignment of scholarly value, and the access to resources and visibility in academic institutions. Linguistic hierarchies and uneven competences perform key gatekeeping functions alongside discriminatory admissions process criteria, peer review norms and expectations, the high financial costs of, for example, participating in important academic conferences, and the tendency of these and other status and access asymmetries to turn more rather than less acute. Questions of positionality, third, and inseparably from location and gatekeeping, 
uh, refer to the multiple and transversal ways in which subject, subject positions are produced, inhabited, and attributed along dimensions of class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and so on, and how they in turn differentially define the possibilities of speaking, writing, and even doing research as my white, male, heterosexual, cis, middle class, and Jewish Israeli position did during my ethnographic work with young neo-Nazis in Germany. Questions of justice, fourth, describe the view shared by many anthropologists that scholars have an ethical commitment to collaborate in emancipatory projects in the world at large, and particularly with the people whom they study. Here, the very chasm between scholarship as distant, uh, objective knowledge of the world and purposeful, active engagement for human liberation and social justice appears as the legacy of colonial modes of knowing. What has been termed activist or committed anthropology uh, hopes to disturb the unevenness in the relation between researcher and researched through authentic modes of reciprocity. Some of the ways in which these four sets of questions define uh, anthropological scholarship today are reflected in my own experience, to which I will come momentarily, but it is probably the last two sets of topics and of methods that presented the most daunting impasses in my research. Questions of topics concern the scholarly division of labor, and I'll have a bit more to say about it in, uh, later on, that assigns particular thematic jurisdictions to different disciplines, and which, generally speaking, has not encouraged anthropologists to apply themselves to the study of the far right or to Europe. While questions of methods revolve around the ethics of our research activities and our relationships with our interlocutors, which are issues of special concern in ethnographic research and particularly in light of the often extractive relations upon which anthropologists have relied in colonial and post-colonial contexts. So in what follows, I will turn to how some of these problems have both shaped and stood in critical tension with my own research and anthropological discussions of ethics and methods more generally. And I hope it will become clear that colonial regimes and their afterlives continue to impact our scholarships in ways that are difficult to evade or challenge. While decolonizing projects too often fall short of the demands of scholarship. And instead of being adopted wholesale as categorical imperatives, must always be considered in relation to the complex contexts within which and about which we do our research. Uh, and it probably wouldn't be an overstatement to say that the research I will be talking about today was, at least in some respects, especially complex. Among the principal challenges that I faced when designing my study of young neo-Nazis was the near absence of similar ethnographic studies, and particularly in anthropology, whether in, whether in the American Anthropological Association annual meetings or in the Council of European Studies conferences uh, or in various conversations with experts in the field, <coughs> it was clear that I was isolated and looked in vain for examples to follow or interlocutors with whom I could share my dilemmas. There were several possible explanations for this. First, the groups I wish to study, no doubt, um, represented an aberrant extreme phenomena. Oh, I can see it there, right? Extreme phenomena. Though today, unfortunately, this may no longer be the case. Yet the anthropological corpus is replete with studies of the exotic, uh, the occult, and the exceptional. So why no studies of the extreme right? Second, the sort of research that, um, uh, that I proposed represented some serious methodological challenges, perhaps most immediately the question of access. But various ethnographers have overcome enormous obstacles, winning the trust of putatively impenetrable groups. 
Again, why not in the case of the extreme right? Finally, there are concerns about physical integrity and safety that are specific to ethnographic research where we insert ourselves into our fields, often alone. But again, ethnographers have produced excellent studies of violent contexts, often placing themselves in dangerous situations along the way. So why not the extreme right? Some anthropologists have proposed that the scarcity of studies in these fields owes to a disciplinary preference for moral hygiene, and that anthropologists should abandon that moral hygiene, and also with it, abandon sympathy in favor of empathy. Others have suggested that anthropologists who often study marginalized people are weary of representing their interlocutors uh, negatively. And all this is certainly true, but it is only part of the story. So first, empathy instead of sympathy perhaps could offer a viable path for the sort of distant studies of the far right um, based on media or political discourse analysis, for example, common to scholarship about the topic at the time. But it was hardly adequate as a guide for navigating the multiple impasses and ambivalences of traditional ethnographic fieldwork and the sorts of um, intimacies and proximities that such fieldwork entails. Secondly, the problem for me was not the risk of negatively stereotyping my interlocutors by fo focusing on their unpleasant um, aspects, which were, to be sure, both stark and numerous, but quite the contrary, the trending, rendering them as three-dimensional, irreducibly complex uh, persons, which is, after all, the ethnographic vocation, would not represent them negatively enough. Finally, these explanations, though valid, remain endogamous to anthropology and cannot account for the place it occupies within a global economy of knowledge. So beyond the internal limits of my own discipline, then, my solitude as an anthropologist of the extreme right in Europe also owed to the position that anthropology and ethnographic research occupy uh, sorry, that occupy within this academic regime of knowledge production. As became palpable to me time and again from the sometimes surprised, sometimes amused reactions to my work by scholars of the extreme right, all of whom seem to have come from other disciplines. This regime assigns uh, to different voices their appropriate place, their value, and their possibilities of enunciation. It operates through forces that push us towards certain paths and dissuade us from taking others, and that are primarily external, or at least irreducible, to our own particular discipline. Thus, if historians frequently scrutinize some of the most repugnant moments in human history, and political scientists investigate wars, genocides, and tyrannies, we anthropologists, to the extent that our interest in such topic is even tolerated, are usually expected to bring our ethnographic perspectives to bear on those who are perceived as the victims, the oppressed, the subaltern. After all, such were the colonial roots of anthropology, which in the words of Haitian anthropologist Michel Wolf Touillot, assigned to it the savage slot a crucial location for the production of civilization, the West, and modernity, and one that has remained with us to this day. There is yet a third type of constraints to the sort of research that I conducted that, while related to the first two, merges neither within a particular academic discipline and institution nor within a global economy of scholarly knowledge production, but rather <coughs> sorry, in that space that we may describe as the ethnographic field. With this term, I want to describe the contested discursive fields within which we become complicit in our ethnographic research, whether voluntarily or not, consciously or not. As ethnographers, we are constantly called upon to position ourselves 
and we are constantly read by the people uh, we ourselves attempt to read. So ethnographic research blurs the distinctions between sympathy and empathy, between narrative and analysis, uh, forcing us into affective relations not necessarily positively charged uh, with our interlocutors, who are also sometimes our audience. The challenges of ethnography acquire a particularly troublesome outline in cases such as mine, and in my opinion are key for understanding why the worrying resurgence of the political far right across the world, um, long in the works, has caught my discipline so badly prepared. The late and long overdue rise in anthropological interest in the study of the far right has spawned all sorts of ethical and methodological challenges, not least because of the tensions um, and incongruities that it has entailed both with the principles heralded by the decolonizing project and with some of the more long-standing ethical staples of our craft from participatory and collaborative knowledge production to full transparency and informed consent. But ethnographic research cannot take such principles as strict imperatives and must always navigate the murky ground between disclosure and concealment, truth and lies, opacity and transparency. This is especially so when setting out to study such groups as mine, and as in my case, doing so under a false name. What I will suggest here is that my story of a Jewish Israeli passing as an American, uh, American anthropology grad student under a different name, which is probably a limit case, may pose some difficult questions for these principles of ethnographic practice and for decolonizing projects more generally. I started researching the far right in a historical moment that witnessed a disturbing wave of right-wing nationalism across Europe. And as part of this incipient anthropological attention to the theme at the turn of the century, which went into full gear only in the mid-2010s with the political triumph of MAGA nationalism uh, in the US. This shift, as I hinted above, was anything but smooth bringing into focus a set of related methodological hurdles. Researchers in this field have had to contend with vexing difficulties of access, of crafting intimate relationships, and of sustaining long-term research engagements, um, all broadly taken as gold standards of ethnographic methods. Meanwhile, they also had to position themselves with respect to the ongoing contemporary efforts to decolonize anthropology um, and reimagine it as a collaborative, horizontal endeavor, one that incorporates interlocutors into research design as what anthropologists Holmes and Marcus have termed epistemic partners. I have been called to answer former violations of these principles, both traditional and new emergent ones in multiple academic contexts, as indeed I might be called upon here today. And yet the consolidation of such relationships of horizontal partnerships and collaboration with my interlocutors appeared not only impossible, but frankly unwelcome. My research also sat uncomfortably with what I referred to earlier as questions of justice or the rightly celebrated possibility, many would say the ethical responsibility of anthropology to combine research with advocacy for the people we study. Opening up wider spaces of enunciation for our interlocutors, placing our skills at the service of their emerging projects, and nourishing a disciplined political commitment to their cause, all of which have become a sine qua non of the anthropological craft for many, seemed beside the point for me. My work has accordingly come under criticism for what some readers and listeners consider its uncritical reproduction of colonial modes of knowledge production. The transformation of the discipline to which the decolonizing critique has called emphasizes precisely the commitment to such principles as collaboration, political solidarity, 
and the unsettling of the distinction between researcher and researched. The extent to which ethnographers of the far right frequently find themselves in violation of contemporary calls for an ethical and political renewal of anthropology in turn reflects a longer standing marginalization within the discipline of certain inconvenient research problems or questions of topics, as I referred to it earlier. And I have already um, mentioned three interrelated dimensions of this omission. It is the last dimension, the ethnographic field, um, and our ethnographic complicities in disputed discursive fields with which the rest of my talk today will grapple. What can anthropology learn from our engagement with the politics of concealment, disclosure, and complicity in our field site? How can such forms of engagement help us reconsider some of the ethical and epistemological challenges that are internal to anthropology as well as those that have been key to the decolonizing project. So allow me at this point to say a few words about the actual circumstances of my research uh, with young right-wing uh, right extremists in East Berlin, very briefly, and the places of secrecy and complicity in it. I already mentioned the problem of access um, that I faced in my work, which at least in practical terms was perhaps the thorniest of all. A team of street social workers were, on, uh, were the only possible entry point I could identify for the sort of immersive ethnography that I hope to achieve. They served loose and dynamic groups of young, gender-mixed, socially marginalized, right-wing extremists, mostly from East German or former East German uh, households, who loitered in outdoors areas that had suffered from <coughs> deindustrialization and economic recession. Some of them were active in local right-wing fraternities and political party chapters. The social workers were enthusiastic about my project and granted my request to embed myself with them in order to get to know their clients. That's how they referred to them. <coughs> they immediately introduced me to the ethical principles of their relationships with these clients, which included treating them as responsible agents, um, answerable for their decisions, partiality to their interests and needs, protecting their confidentiality and insisting on sincerity and transparency. And these are just ethical principles of social work in general, right? regardless of who your clients are. Next, they announced that to join them, I would need to change my Hebrew name, Nitzan, conceal my Jewish-Israeli identity, and present myself as Nate, an American anthropology PhD student <laughs> from Chicago. So that was my year and a half as Nate. Um, now, fieldwork can be an overwhelmingly complex emotional experience, exhilarating, boring, emotionally draining, or generative of various personal insecurities. During my early period in the field, I felt an acute paranoia about my identity and reviewed my clothes, backpack, pockets, and belongings obsessively for traces that could betray my real name. As time went on and I ingratiated myself into the groups I had set out to study, such worries subsided and gave way to familiarity and routine. And yet, throughout my fieldwork, I suffered from a repetitive nightmare in which a band of neo-Nazi skinheads figured out my deception and chased after me, and which very anchors characteristically for me, I remembered vividly the following morning. Beyond angry neo-Nazi mobs catching up with me in my sleep and episodes of obsessive paranoia, my pseudonym presented more wakeful preoccupations. When my young interlocutors departed for trips across the Polish border to hunt, hunt for commodities that were banned or hard to come by in Germany, I didn't join them for fear of ID checks upon our return. When police cordoned us off and requested IDs during a neo-Nazi march, my heart missed several beats. They eventually let us all out. On other occasions, I accompanied one of my on another occasion, I accompanied one of my closest interlocutors, 
a young, violent, multiply convicted neo-Nazi to a clandestine meeting with the representative of an organization that would assist him in quitting the scene. I trembled as I realized I had already met the representative a year earlier uh, under my real name in a different context. To my relief, he seemed to have forgotten our previous encounter. So conducting ethnographic fieldwork under a false name confronted me with numerous risks and demanded elaborate strategies for minimizing my exposure to them, requiring careful consideration of the sorts of activities in which I participated. It also required that I inhabit my persona and act it out in every quotidian interaction. Evading discovery and disclosure then was partly a matter of planning, of taking preventive measures, of knowing and keeping to my limits, of maintaining my two lives in Berlin as far apart as I could. Partly it was also about letting myself be hailed by my pseudonym, about inhabiting my new name. But it was also, also al always also a matter of sheer fortune of close calls that came to naught, of nightmares that did not turn into reality by way of chance, rather than thanks to strategic cunning. Exposure would have had serious implications for the social workers who prioritized my safety over the trust they had worked so hard to establish with their clients, and who at best would have suffered a serious setback in these efforts to win their confidence. It would have probably spent some, spelled some concrete danger to me, and I could expect word of my exposure to reach virtually all of my interlocutors swiftly, um, making it risky to show my face in the neighborhood, and almost certainly bringing my uh, research to a premature end, which as a grad student, you know, that's the highest risk, right? That's, uh, it's like, it's like uh, in Harry Potter when Hermione says, you know, we could be, we could die or worse, be expelled, right? <laughs> um, yet even if all went well, as in fact it did, the adoption of a pseudonym implied a departure from anthropological tradition in another sense as well. In anthropology, uh, the special epistemological value of ethnographic research is conventionally attributed to extended research space, like I mentioned. Right? So often ethnographers draw on career-long engagements with their field sites and their interlocutors to elaborate insightful uh, understandings of the long-term processes that they observe. For me, the change of name <coughs> imply diminishing possibilities for continuing with my research subsequently. Given that various forms of exposure were promised eventually to reveal who I was. My research demanded that I sacrifice future possibilities of following up on it in advance. So concerns about identity, access, and the ethical, as well as practical dilemmas that they have entailed in my fieldwork have loomed large in scholarly responses to it, often overshadowing discussions of the substantive arguments that I have made about nationalism and right-wing politics. This sustained interest, I think, reflects the intensifying encounter of current anthropology with questions of ethnographic methods in the context of increased, uh, um, in increasing calls for decolonization. Such debates sometimes frame the cover of a false name as exceptional. That's the European Association of Anthropology, for example. Um, at, others, at other times as deviant. That's the American Anthropological Association. Uh, but while anthropological literature on the topic is hard to find, scholars from other disciplines have, in fact, taken up similar questions. For example, regarding the legitimacy of covert research. Uh, especially in a historical context characterized by a surge in interest in radical political ideologies under the sign of the so-called war on terror. So some have argued that covert fieldwork remained a legitimate strategy both methodologically and ethically um, in certain special cases of radical groups. Uh, 
talking about people who are scholars of religion, for example, sociologists of political radicalism. More broadly, however, sociologists have argued that secrecy forms an essential part of all social action. And in the words of Richard Mitchell, an integral part of social science research. In this view, understanding secrecy and disclosure as binary opposites and volitional choices reproduces positivist empiricist approaches. While potentially risky, secrecy is not only necessary for the production of knowledge, but also an ordinary dimension of the lives of those whom we study. Such a view questions the moral high ground usually granted to overt methods and informed consent, since even presumably overt research usually involves a whole set of covert practices that are sanitized or silenced. So, for example, when ethnographers feign ignorance to draw out explanations, and there are many other examples you can think of. Um, and interlocutors often cannot fully understand how they are being researched. Furthermore, and furthermore, may frequently not be in a position to withhold consent because of their location in local hierarchies. Right? So while prioritizing disclosure and consent centers on the well-being of interlocutors, the ethical considerations of fieldwork must also include the researcher, the discipline, and the broader society where other considerations come into play. Anthropologist Kirsten Bell has echoed these arguments in her powerful critique of the anthropological fetishization of informed consent, which according to her was uncritically borrowed from biomedical sciences in the 90s as a dogma that promised to answer the ethical dilemmas that emerged from the discipline's intensifying attention to its colonial past and post-colonial present. Yet partial truths are essential to ethnographic fieldwork, just as the latter's spontaneous nature resists premeditated choice and explicit announcement of intentions. Such ambivalences were everywhere in my own fieldwork. Beyond my great secret of my name, my uh, identity, what about all that my interlocutors did know about me? They knew that I was an anthropology PhD student, that I had come to their neighborhood to study them, uh, and that I would publish books and articles about them. Many of them liked the idea. Uh, during our time together, they came to know a range of other dimensions of my personality through long talks, and were certainly keenly aware that I neither shared their political convictions nor intended to join their struggle or advocate uh, for them. Was my fieldwork covert? The answer must be neither entirely positively nor entirely, entirely positive nor entirely negative. The distinction between honesty and dishonesty, truth and lies, secrecy and disclosure in ethnographic fieldwork sometimes reveals itself under critical scrutiny as far more porous and unstable than decolonizing discussions of ethics and methodology often allow. Indeed, it is as porous as social life itself. There are several questions we might want to ask about such distinctions. What sorts of assumptions about the speaking subject of transparent discourse do they rest upon? How do they frame identity in relation to specific regimes of authenticity? What place do they grant the interlocutors and the broader audiences of verbal acts of, dis of disclosure <coughs> or of the performative indexing of truth? How do they draw the ethical divide from which parameters of responsibility and attributions of honesty emerge and upon which they draw? The imperative of complete transparency conceives of the bearer of ethical responsibility as an agentive singularity, a confessional agent that speaks a reflexive truth and is therefore self a self-identical author with legitimate claims to authenticity. But this is a flattened notion of identity that 
As ethnographers, we would never impose upon our interlocutors. Why would we assume that our case is any different? The first problem then with a decolonizing ethical framework that would look to such distinctions for foundations is the question of coherence. Ethnographers are perhaps particularly well positioned to recognize the multiple and often divergent dimensions that intersect to define those whom we study. I have mentioned already how, in my case, various dimensions intersected to define the possibilities and limits of my research. Other differently positioned researchers would no doubt walk down different paths and face different obstacles. We and the people we study contain multitudes that are not necessarily coherent and sometimes are flagrantly dissonant, perhaps especially when one attempts an ethnographic study of the far right. A second problem concerns the performativity of discourse. As is well known, the notion of the performative shifts our attention from questions of truth to questions of effectivity and appropriateness. It therefore disturbs confessional modes of truth production. The question here is not whether the ethnographer has been transparent, but uh, how effectively and to what end they have performed transparency. Or in J.L. Austin's terms, the illocutionary force and perlocutionary effect of their transparent speech acts. Anthropologists such as Stanley Timbaya have also insisted on considering performativity as the dramaturgical dimension of social interaction, the presentation of self in Irving Goffman's terms. <coughs> we routinely perform different social roles, often switching between registers of speech, style, and corporal behavior at short notice. We are well aware that performances of professorial professionalism, I hope I'm getting it right here, or of professorness um, adequate to the university classroom context would not win us friends at the bar, right? except perhaps if effectively employed as self-parody. Yet surely few would condemn professors as insincere or hypocritical for acting professionally in the classroom and informally elsewhere. In our fieldwork, we easily document such situated performances as anthropologists, and they often stand at the very center of our analysis. There are three points I'd like to make about such performative positionings. The first we might think of as their syntax. Everyday performances, for example, linguistic register switching, rather than animating a coherent and consistent persona, instead embed and arrange social types within and in relation to each other, often recursively, by appropriating and citing different social voices um, to fashion complex rather than flat characters. Second, the characters they perform appear flexible and hybrid constructions rather than binary oppositions. Finally, the questions they raise, again, are not one of veracity or sincerity, but of the effective channeling of social interaction. So just like the people whom we study, we ethnographers are regularly called upon to perform ourselves in different situations. Conscious impression management is for that very reason a standard topic in anthropology method seminars, for, and, and uh, graduate students explicitly reflect on how to manage their image proactively and deliberately uh, in the field so as not to cede complete control of it to others. We may avoid certain activities, so for example, crossing national boundaries and risking identity checks while actively seeking to engage in others, for example, Drinking beer is indispensable for sociability and trust in the context of my research with young German neo-Nazis. We may linguistically perform vernacular informality in one setting and expert authority in another. 
And we may need to push back strenuously against social roles that others may ascribe to us and that could put our research or ourselves at risk. So the problems of coherence and performativity thus lead us to a third problem with categorical ethical frameworks, which is that of secrecy and disclosure. The authors I mentioned earlier have argued that secrecy forms an essential dimension of research, just as much as of social life at large. Moreover, secrets come in different kinds and with various ends. Uh, some are small, others big. Some are intimate, others public. Some are innocent, others far from it. Consider the case of Melissa Hackman, an anthropologist who con conducted ethnographic fieldwork with members of a neo-Pentecostal ex-gay organization in Cape Town. Uh, in South Africa. So Hackman carefully calibrated what she calls her gender presentation um, and responses to her interlocutors' racist, sexist, and homophobic remarks um, to facilitate her accents, access and to avert suspicions both about her lesbian sexuality and about her progressive politics. She never explicitly lied, though, because she was never explicitly asked. Um, but she scrupulously kept dimensions of her personality out of view. Doing so already anticipated a certain response among the people she had hoped to study. When, as her fieldwork came to an end, she revealed her sexuality to some of her interlocutors, the news came to them as a surprise. And sometimes, at least for some of them, as betrayal. And she describes that in the book that she published on this research. Another researcher, Arturo Diaz Cruz, conducted ethnographic fieldwork in a Mexico City neighborhood infamous for organized crime, narcotics, weapons, human trafficking, and other illegal markets. His immediate fixer on the street baptized him as his cousin and introduced him uh, to young vigilantes who extorted informal vendors for protection. He slowly and painstakingly worked his way through a sequence of doorkeepers who accepted him and in turn vouched for him in what he has called an economy of favors. While he was actively complicit in his presentation as a cousin, many of his interlocutors demonstrated palpable skepticism about this kinship designation. Understanding it as indexing forms of socially mediated obligations rather than literal family proximity. This was, for all purposes, a public secret and one which they didn't seem to mind. Was it a lie? <clears throat> Coherence, performativity, and secrecy suggest that ethnography <coughs> sits uncomfortably with these categorical imperatives. Uh, that would attempt to separate a transparent, crystal clear ethical space for the practice of research from the murkiness of everyday life. All three converge in the problem of complicity, which is ultimately one of social relationality or the sometimes reciprocal, sometimes asymmetrical webs of obligations in which we participate. Complicity is Janus-faced, and anthropology in particular has been complicit in the liberation struggles of the oppressed just as much as in colonial projects of domination. How does complicity inform and shape the relationships into which we are drawn as ethnographers, the ways in which we invite our interlocutors to collude in our deceptions, and in which we, too, are called upon to collaborate in their own dissimulations. Various other secrets and deceptions were at play in my fieldwork besides my false name. The social workers with whom I collaborated, for example, would routinely withhold certain information about their activities and loyalties from their client and coordinate that, for example, with state authorities. They were also keenly aware that their clients often 
colluded to divulge only partial truths. And they constantly had to piece together coherent narratives from the fragments of knowledge at their disposal. For example, about the extent of their clients' involvement in organized right-wing extremist uh, groups and activities, which came with a certain cost. Traversing my fieldwork uh, were there for multiple transactions of complicity, whether between the social workers and the bureaucratic and surveillance apparatuses of the state, uh, among my neo-Nazi interlocutors, or between the social workers and their clients, who frequently concealed confidential information as well from state authorities. These complicities challenged not only the ethical ideas ideals of a decolonized anthropology, but often to the moral values and commitments that my interlocutors themselves professed. The people who we study regularly collaborate to deceive us and each other, while also letting themselves be deceived. If we pull them into acts of collusion to advance our projects, they too in turn routinely recruit us to further theirs. Thus, Diaz, who I mentioned earlier, for example, was himself recruited into an economy of favors in which he offered his gatekeeper the opportunity to perform reciprocity with the mutual acquaintance that, who had put them in touch. At times, determining who recruits whom into complicity may become well nigh impossible. In my case too, the social workers had their own very good reasons to collude with me, having to do, and I'm not gonna go into it, but having to do with their disadvantaged and isolated position within state services and sort of the state attention to uh, marginalized youth, right, ex right wing extremist youth. So complicity inhabits our interactions in the field, just as it does in other non-research settings. Our interlocutors equally find themselves wrapped in webs of collusion. They, do, they too expect from us certain complicities and grant us others in return. Silencing our relational uh, entrenchment within these webs of complicity and insisting on ideas of full transparency risks overlooking uh, the complex ambivalences of social relations, obligations, and conflicts. It champions a holier-than-thou posture formulated in the language of scientific distance and affirming a fully agentive, non-reciprocal relationship with those whom we set out to study. We end up then with an ethical framework that would remain unaffected by its engagement with the social relationships that comprise the very object of research that it is expected to buttress. Conducted largely under a false name, my own fieldwork offered me no such possibilities. In my view, the costs that such forms of research may incur in terms of our ethical rectitude must be assessed within a broad framework that attends to the multiplicity of our commitments how may we remain, as anthropologists, for example, speaking from my position, accountable not only to our interlocutors in the field, but also to the public at large? To what extent should we actively seek to produce knowledge about such urgent concerns as the rise of the far right, nationalism, and racism in the world today, even as we may thereby relativize or even abandon some decolonizing principles. Some may argue that the price to be paid for such knowledge could not possibly be justified. Others have argued that it is precisely our responsibility to bring our ethnographic perspectives to bear on such pressing matters that requires us to cultivate reciprocal relationships of friendship and help with our far-right interlocutors. Neither position seems necessarily warranted to me, though they could no doubt become relevant in specific cases. Both appear to look for categorical certainties and stable footholds where in fact we often find little but ambiguities and contradictions. So far from afflicting only such admittedly 
oddball field work experiences as mine. And, this is, I will end with this. Such tensions and ambivalences inhabit social relations at large. Uncertainty is about the coherence of ourselves, the authenticity and the ends of our performances, the negotiation of disclosure and secrecy, and the crisscrossing webs of complicity in anthropological fieldwork require both subtlety and flexible openness. This, not so much uh, to resolve them, as to sustain that precarious tightrope equilibrium that allows us as anthropologists, despite everything, to continue and practice ethnographic research and to offer its unique insights into the critical conversations of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really fascinating talk. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. If you just want to raise your hand, Becca or I will bring you the microphone. Um, so you want to start us off? Yeah, I'll start. I'll leave that. <laughs> um, so thanks for the talk. It was really, really interesting. I'm one of the anthropologists in the room. And I'm an archaeologist, but I also do ethnography. So, to me, you did a really good job showing that, that we have, like, a lot of times in anthropology, we have a happily ever after story about research, about how you're supposed to do these things, and it's always supposed to go this way. And that means even if you're doing a more decolonizing form of anthropology, or if you're doing, let's say, standard traditional. And obviously, life, especially when you work in places where it's messier, it all, those orthodoxies fall apart. So I'm really wondering, what's at stake if we don't become more flexible? What do we lose out on? Not just in terms of like anthropology as a discipline, but also about what we can do to effect change in our world, to, to, to fight against these oppressions and structural violence. Right. Um, I mean, I think that the short answer that I would give, but you know, as my anthropologist advisor would always tell me, it's more complex. Um, the short answer is that we lose the ability precisely to intervene in such important conversations. And we really haven't done it as anthropologists. Only recently, you know, basically you can see since 2016, there's a whole bunch of American anthropologists that went to the woods to run with right wing militias, but none of that happened before 2016. Um, and I expect a whole range of books to be published within the next decades. But, uh, but, but these things were happening uh, both here and very much so in Europe. And anthropologists were not part of the conversation. And so for me, that's sort of what I try to, uh, the point I try to make is that we need to be part of it. We have something to contribute to these conversations. Most of the people with whom I talked about the far right, as I was starting to become interested in that theme and to study it, have never met a neo-Nazi in their lives. But they were authorities on the topic, right? Uh, is there anything to be gained from knowing these people? I think the anthropological position would be that there is, right? That's, uh, uh, maybe that's another debate that one can have. So, so I think that's, that's a big part of it, of what I would, I would say, you know, um, what we might risk if we don't uh, take a slightly more flexible approach there. And at a different level, you know, perhaps it's, we can think about it more generally and think that regardless of the topic and the context, if we don't have that sort of flexibility in our work, then we're missing out on something, right? I think that Oh, Hi, I'm Laurie Nathan from the Crock Institute. I'm not an anthropologist. <laughs> Nate. Um, what you're describing can be understood as a framework for understanding the ethical dilemmas in your field. You are describing a situational incompatibility of good norms or good principles that might, in good circumstances, all be compatible, but in particular circumstances are not. 
And my sense of your answer to the question, so how do we resolve these dilemmas, is to say, well, we need to be flexible. And second, these principles are not categorical, they are ambiguous and contradictory. Okay. But I think there are other considerations, and, and maybe you were raising them, but I didn't pick them up clearly enough. The one is, are there principles that are non-derogatable? So they are non-violate, what's the right, right word? Violatable. Violable. Is there a hierarchy of principles so that you can weigh them up in terms of some kind of scale? A third consideration would be, what is, what is the extent of harm done if you abandon or dilute some of the principles and what is the benefit that you seek to derive so that you're weighing up harms against benefits? I'm not suggesting that they're categorical answers to any of this. It's all going to be contested in the nature of norms and principles. But there are, I'm really suggesting that there are other ways in which you can think, one can think about how to resolve these dynamics. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. I think that's, that's true and maybe could be integrated better into the arguments. Um, so, for example, I think one has to think hard as an anthropologist about the sort of absolute priorization of our ethical commitments to our interlocutors in anthropology. And partly what I was trying to suggest is that we have other ethical commitments that sometimes must, could be thought of as, as important or more. Uh, you know, the situation might be different here. As I, it's always situated, right? I work as a public, at a public university. I have a certain ethical commitment to the public. The public's paying my salary, right? Um, and that's true for many uh, researchers around the world. Um, so, so, uh, so, so all that is, is very true. And uh, I don't know if uh, there are some principles that are not viable. I would, I would like to think that there are some, right? I would like to think that there are some practices, there are some ethnographies um, that I find disturbing, where I, I think to myself, that principle should not... Uh, have been violated. I don't know if people who are familiar with Alice Goffman's book, for example, that was a very disturbing case where I felt she crossed some lines that shouldn't be crossed. You should not be going around uh, shotgun with your friends looking for the person, helping them identify the person, the, the person they want to assassinate. In a, just to give one example, but the others, where I think, you know, you could do that research and avoid that situation, right? Um, so, but I don't have, a, again, a categorical answer to it, which are and which aren't. That's probably the ethics and the philosophy department that they'll be able to come up with some model. But I can just say that intuitively, that seemed to me like a line that shouldn't have been crossed. And several other lines that I think she crossed in that book, and some other ethnographers have also crossed. But, but I think generally, people today tend to be more cautious so, so perhaps not um, uh, taking, the, taking principles as, as, as too strict rather than as not strict enough. And, and I think it has something to do at least with the call for decolonization, which I think is an important call, but that needs to be also approached with some caution. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but good points. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, well, so I'll do the last question. Yeah. Otherwise, I have one. Oh, here you go. Do you want? Oh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm actually curious, because um, you mentioned the research you did, right, in, in Germany with the right-wing youth, and that in a way it was possible to do that, because I'm also thinking that was 2004, 2005, like almost 20 years ago when social mm -hmm. media was not there. Do you think it would be possible to do that like 20 years later now and then I'm also wondering did any of the kids like find out about your identity or and then or like how does because you also talk about the youth what does that also mean I'm thinking do people like stop being part of the scene once they like turn 30, 35 or 40 whatever um, that age is so there are I guess multiple parts of my question but um, I'm curious about some of your answers. Okay, so uh, I see three questions there. The first is the issue of internet and whether it would be possible to do it today. I think it would be a lot harder. 
it would be a lot harder. I have to say, internet existed. We're, I'm not, we're not that old. I'm not that old. Even Google existed, and probably if they really tried, I had some internet presence as a graduate student, they, but it was not like today. Um, they had phones. There was already multimedia phones. Uh, I remember we like, would download you know, Nazi music from their phones, and uh, but there were, it was pre-iPhone and pre-Facebook. But you, you know, there was some technology there too. It, it wasn't like Stone Age. So, um, so they probably could have, but they never did. And I think that has to do with those particular people. Other people might have been more cautious and more careful and would have researched. Uh, done a better job researching who I was. In any case, they would have a much easier time today where they just, with one photo, they could get all my info from the web. So, so it would be more difficult, no doubt. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it would be more difficult. And um, one might have to be more sincere, you know, but who one is. Uh, and um, the, they found out not that I know. I looked for some of them in recent years, and I couldn't find them because they're gone. They're ad Nobody knows where they are. I managed to locate one of them. They were um, in detention. I couldn't see them because their, had, their health was bad, and their social worker told me, no, now it's not a good time. And now they had moved to Sweden and joined some neo-Nazi metal bands there and all sorts of things, you know. Um, so I've tried to locate some of them and it's been difficult. I hope I will. And I, and I definitely with the intention of telling them who I am. Now, they're not, they weren't very avid readers of anything. So, um, you know, much less academic books in English. So I found it hard to believe that they somehow got word of it on their own, you know. Um, and the issue of age, so the age, age is a very important question there. There is definitely sort of a life cycle element to these groups. Um, some people, you know, so one of the people I knew there, you know, at some point he married his girlfriend, they had a baby. She was as much a neo-Nazi as he was. Um, but then she told him, you got to stop doing it. I don't want you in jail every second month. I need you here. You need to you know, pay the rent. You need to take care of the baby. Enough with your friends at the train station. And he stopped, you know, and, and sort of like basically not because of a change, a change of opinions or like a change, because she told him, you know, you're out of here if you continue hanging out with these guys. Um, she had her priorities clearer. Than, than he. Um, and, and I think for a lot of people, something like that happens when they actually have to start working, when they have families, etc. Priorities change. They're no, they no longer have the time uh, or the interest in getting drunk at the train station or at the park with their friends, and certainly not of getting into trouble with the police and with anti-fascists. It can be much more violent sometimes than the the neo-Nazis, but um, so um, so things like that do happen. But then there are always all those all these people who remain somehow, who never sort of grow out of it and sort of age there. And some of them become leaders, others sort of hangers on, you know. Um, so among the people that I worked with, I don't know of anyone who became a leader. But some of them are still. Not all of them have totally left that scene and moved on either. Well, since we have one minute, I just have one small question. Um, so when working with these social workers and coming up with the plan to become you know, Nate from Chicago, at any point did you then question your own ethics in doing that or question your own ability to do the kind of research that you set out to do? Uh, I think I was... Uh, you know, young, and uh, <laughs> and I probably would have uh, questioned more today uh, with my experience. But uh, no, at the time I was just so excited that this was actually happening. I had gotten funding for it. You know, my professor all, all, always told me, "Are you really going to make it? Is that possible? Is it?" You know, and I was like, "Yes, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it." 
Um, and I think that sort of blinded me to a lot of the problems that later I had to confront um, in my academic life. And I'm sort of paying the price for it since then. But, uh, but it's also, you know, it was, uh, uh, for me, uh, great to be able to do the research that I imagined that I, would, that I wanted to do and that I already had come to think would probably be impossible. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating lecture. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. Thank you.